This is the Regain Wellness Podcast with Jamie Logie, episode 113. What are the benefits of low intensity interval training? 88 miles per hour! Hey guys, what's happening? Welcome back to the podcast. I'm Jamie Logia. I run RegainWellness.com and you're listening to the Regain Wellness Podcast. So thank you for joining me here today. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe um, on iTunes. You probably have, potentially if you're listening to this on any like iPhone, Android, whatever. But if you're listening to it anywhere else, make sure you subscribe, uh, subscribe on iTunes and then that way you get the show automatically sent to you each week. Um, yeah, you don't have to think about it ready to go. And today, this is interesting. Um, So I'm talking about low intensity interval training, and you might have thought I meant to say high intensity interval training. But this new um, HIIT training is is very well known, and the benefits are understood. And we're going to talk about why high intensity interval training is effective and beneficial. But low intensity interval training is something not that it's new, but it's it's kind of on the fringe. People haven't either heard of it or they don't know how it works. Um, it's it's actually incredibly simple and might even provide some of the same benefits while not being as intense or as hard as the HIT training. So this is lit training, not not lit like the kids say, but L I I T, low intensity interval training. So I'll try and break it all down to you. Um, it's something like I said, not that the the concepts new i mean people have been either doing it intentionally or inintention or unintentionally for a while but getting more of a grasp on it might be something that's relatively new for a lot of people so yeah we'll try and break this all down and yeah let's get to it so first off uh like i said i'll talk about high intensity interval training if you want to hear more in depth i have an entire podcast episode um, on this episode 37. And if you basically, if you go to the show notes today, which is just going to regain wellness.com slash one thirteen, that's the episode number. That's where I link up everything I've talked about. So if you're wanting to listen to this episode, not sure where to find it, if you can just remember, or if you're listening now, going to regain wellness.com slash one thirteen, you can even pause this, go back, listen to that one, get a kind of quick refresher. Um, or more in-depth info. I've even got a blog on it too. That's even way more in-depth because um, there's a lot of research and history too that goes behind high-intensity interval training. So I'll cover that quickly here. And you're if you're in a gym or if you've been working out or doing any sort of not advanced training but a little more um, in-depth or, or intense, you've probably come across or even doing hit training. And what that is is. Um, it's beneficial for a few reasons. First off, it doesn't take as long as your normal um, gym time. It's a shorter period workout, but it's way more intense, but maybe going to get you some better results in the long run. So it's kind of the ultimate fat burning, muscle building type workout. It's basically performing a period of super intense exercise followed by a less intense recovery period and it's this this combination this short burst activity followed by a slower recovery period slower recovery period that's providing a lot of tremendous health benefits and even and and body composition um, changes as far as more lean muscle and more body fat loss so it's 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 simple approach again it's just more accustomed to what our bodies are kind of built to do so what a typical high intensity interval training or hit workout looks like would be to start with a warm up five ten minutes. Um, very important, get the blood flow to the muscles, get things a little more looser. I mean, ideally, I'm sure you know this, but you don't want to go into really any any exercise cold. I'm making air quotes here. Um, it doesn't. I think stretching before workouts, that's a whole other topic. I don't think that's that necessary. Stretching at the end of a workout is very beneficial, but coming in and stretching and then doing a workout might not be ideal. Again, you're stretching cold muscles. They do better when they've got, like I said, more blood flow to them. So that would look like some, you know, if light, depending on what you're doing, light jogging, um, warming up on a stationary bike or a cross trainer, just something that gets the heart rate up and the blood flow to the muscles. A very Another good thing is dynamic stretching. That's what I do all the time before workouts or before hockey. Um, 
it's involves like arm swings and leg swings, but in more of a controlled manner. So it's, it's hard to describe without showing you visually. Um, but if you're standing, uh, upright leg swings would just be, you know, bringing your swinging your leg up. So trying to have your knee hit your chest and then extending it back behind you as fast as you, well, not as fast as you can, but as high up as you can, um, and try and get, a deep stretch. So you're doing each swing around, you know, say 20 times. So it serves as a uh, dual purpose. It does help in more of a natural stretching motion that you're not holding like a static stretch when it's cold, but it's, it's kind of a cardio movement. So there's blood flow going to the muscle and, and it's a light stretch at the same time. And it gets you more prepared for what you're about to do. If it's more of an athletic endeavor, because it's going to, you know, mimic some of the movements you're about to do. So you'll see, um, I mean, most athletes do some form of dynamic stretching beforehand because it, it's, you know, a combination of all those things like a coordinated movement. It's kind of an athletic movement. It's, uh, you know, the blood flow thing, the stretching, the, the warm up, the whole deal. So um, with whatever you do before the hit training, yeah, five to 10 minutes. The workout itself is relatively short. You're looking at three to 10 rounds of this high intensity exercise separated by that, you know, medium lower ish intensity rest period that's done for the recovery phase. So the high intensity portion of this, of the workout is going to be almost all out, almost a hundred percent. Like this is not for the, you know, faint at heart. You, you want to on a perceived exertion scale. Um, yeah, you want to be at a 10, you want to be at a nine or 10 as hard as you can without, you know, potentially injuring yourself or, or passing out the recovery portion is going to be less maybe a 50 percent exertion um and the way it looks is you pick your whatever your exercise is going to be for that day i'll talk about different choices in a sec the high intensity portion where you're going that full 100 percent all out is going to be around 30 to 45 seconds then the recovery phase can be anywhere from 15 to 60 seconds, maybe a little longer, depending on your level of fitness. You'd, you'd only want the lower recovery times when you're at a really high level. For the average person, it's going to be a, about a minute, maybe a minute and a half at the most of that that slower recovery phase. So the, the, the classic example is going to be alternating between sprinting and walking. So whether that's you know on a track, you're at the beach trying to look good, treadmill, whatever. 30 to 45 seconds is when you crank it up, go all out sprint as hard as you can. Um, and then you're going to slow down and you're going to walk for around that, you know, 45 seconds to a minute. Just keep yourself moving. Like I said, it's a, like an active recovery. You're not going to just stop, sit down um, first because that, you know, prevents the the kind of the dynamics of the hit workout from working. And then second, doing anything intense and then just stopping is not super ideal. That's what can lead to cramping. You get more blood pooling in the muscles. You want to keep moving, whatever you're doing. So in this case, that recovery portion is part of the the whole workout. So that's pretty much all there is to it. It's super short. I mean, this workout can be anything from four minutes, like a Tabata style workout. Um, and it could be up to 30. Now it's not going to be more than 30 because then that's defeating the whole purpose of this form of training, but that's not a long time. But at the same time that you don't want to go much longer than that, if you're doing it properly, yeah, 15 minutes, you're probably, you're probably good 20 at the most. So the beauty of high intensity interval training is you don't necessarily even, you don't need to do it in a gym. You don't need super good equipment. Like I said, that sprinting walking example is probably the simplest and probably the most effective um, way to perform hit training. But there's lots of other, other ways. Like I like doing it on bikes, like stationary bikes. So you can, that's probably one of the best in my opinion, because you can control the intensity perfectly. You've got that dial on it and whatever the, the dial that in, increases the intensity you, whether it's got numbers on it or it's just a perceived thing, it's, you know, that idea of cranking it up pretty much as high as you can go, obviously, so you can keep the thing moving. Um, not so it's like full lock that you can stand up on it and not move, but keeping it, you know, high intensity and then you can back it off, which is nice. So you can do that in an instant. Um, 
Other examples that, uh, for the exercise choice, you can do running stairs and then walking down them for the recovery period. So, I mean, that's outside. It's free. Um, intense skipping is a good one, kind of classic um, you know, boxers and people like that do it. So really high paced skipping, what do they call those like double unders where it's going under twice and then a really slow, gradual, um, recovery one burpees is probably another classic where you're working all the muscles in your body. Um, you know, all those energy systems at the same time, you can use like elliptical machines and things like that. They're not bad. Um, again, because you can keep the, in, the intensity up on them though. I, the, I find on elliptical machines, the intensity um, increments are not super high. Like I find you can actually get them going too fast and it's a bigger machine. So there's a lot of moving parts to it. So I don't necessarily find them stable, but depending on your level of fitness, if you're newer to this or, you know, you've been doing the gym for a little while or you might, you know, you have some knee problems or joint issues. This, this doesn't have to look like Usain Bolt going on it. It's just intense for what is good for you. So if you're used to going like say comfortably, just rough example, say the, um, indicator on the elliptical machine is, um, just like a one to 20 thing. So 20 being the highest, um, interval, um, intensity that you can go, say you're normally going along at a three. So that doesn't mean you have to go to 20. You uh, like just going at a 10 might be perfect for you. So it doesn't have to be, um, over the top. It's just what is going to challenge you for that, you know, that 30 second increment before you dial it back on down. So, um, on it, even in, like if you're even brand new to fitness, you can do jumping jacks at a high intensity and then just walk around. This is why you might be more interested in what I'll talk about in a sec with the low intensity interval training and how that might apply more. But so basically the, the whole point of this is the results that it gets. So this goes back, not super, super far, but the first research showing that, um, hit training was, was better for body composition for fat loss than more than over, you know, just steady state cardio, which people might do for an hour, an hour and a half. You can get this better or the same results in much less time. So in 94, it's actually from Canada here. They do, uh, where is it? Laval university it showed that young men and women who performed a 15 week hit program lost significantly more body fat than those who performed a 20 week continuous steady state endurance program. So, um, this occurred despite the 20 week program was burning 15,000 more calories than the high intensity group. But the idea with the high intensity is it's creating a lot of better hormonal changes in the body. That's getting those results. So same thing in, uh, where is this 2001 study from East Tennessee state university found that participants that followed an eight week hit program dropped 2% body fat compared to those that followed a steady state treadmill cardio routine who ended up losing around no body fat. So the way hit training is able to do this is, um, it, it, like I said, it has those hormonal impacts on the body. It increases your resting metabolic rate. It lowers your insulin resistance. Um, it creates skeletal muscle adaptions. So that's allowing for more, um, muscle engagement, which burns off more fat, um, and improves your glucose tolerance. So your body's better able to handle, um, you know, different forms of carbohydrates later on. It's, um, not going to be as, you know, when we talk about insulin resistance, your body has trouble, um, when it's constantly secreting insulin over and over and it, you know, the exposure to carbs and that insulin response and basically your pancreas burns out. And then that's, what's leading you to, you know, like type two diabetes and whatnot. So doing exercise like this lowers that insulin resistance and increases your insulin sensitivity. So your body's able to handle those, those carbs and sugars a bit better. Um, also there's recent studies from the American journals, uh, physiology, and it shows that, that hit training increases the amount of, of these special proteins in the muscle that are basically like their carrier proteins and they're responsible for carrying fat into your mitochondria. You remember that's the powerhouse of the cell. If you remember back to biology and, and it's burned away, that fat's burned away by up to 50% more because of this hit training. Um, and then the more of these proteins you have in the muscle, the more fat you can burn during work as an after. So the other big advantage of this high intensity interval training is something called EPOC, which is not a cheap 
poor version of Tupac. It's called Excess Post Exercise Oxygen Consumption. Basically, think of it as an afterburn effect. So it means your body is burning calories long after the exercise is done. So the minute you stop, um, it's almost like getting going because your body used up so much oxygen and it's got to replenish it through the body because um, it's gone into an oxygen deficit. And the way it um, replenishes it is by using more calories in the body. So it's showing that um, the research showing that this effect can last up to 24 and some say even 36 hours after exercise that your body is still burning these calories. So that's why it's one of the most popular ways um, for people looking to, you know, lose some body fat, gain some lean muscle, get a little fitter. Um, it does a lot. Like I said, there, it, this goes a lot deeper if you want to listen to that episode number 37 um, or read the blog on it. Again, this is all at regainwellness.com slash 113. So that brings us to low intensity interval training, which now that you understand what high intensity interval training is, you can probably figure out what the low intensity looks like. And it's seen as a promising alternative to someone who's maybe wanting to do this sort of hit style training, but they're new to fitness. So they don't want to go super intense right away, or they've you, maybe it's part of the older population, or you might be a little, you might have those joint issues. You can't go as intense or you're looking to lose some more body fat. So the intensity level can't be as high. That's what this low intensity interval training is. So how it works is the dynamic is the same as far as the way it's segmented where you have a, a more intense phase and then the recovery phase. But now we're looking at the intensity phase not being as intense and the recovery phase being a lot longer. So um, like I say, you break it down the same way. If you were starting off, the, the perfect example for this is to do um, a walking running combination, but it doesn't even have to be the running per se. So if you were out walking with someone you would go along for a, you know around five to eight minutes and that's going to start getting you warmed up. When you're ready, you're going to gradually increase your speed until you reach the pace where you'd have to be running a little bit. Like This doesn't have to be super fast, but something where you can go where you'd still be able to, like a light jog, something where you could, be, you could still hold a conversation with someone. If you're gasping for breath, it's going to be too intense in this um, lit training. So get to that pace, and you're going to do that for around 90 seconds. Um, like I said, it's going to take you a little bit to find where that kind of sweet spot is for you. Um, so you're going along for the 90 seconds. Like I said, it, it's going to feel tough, not but not like a sprint. That's the big difference. But basically, you shouldn't have to stop and catch your breath. So after that, you're going to slow down and go back to that recovery pace, which is um, – that slower walk. It's basically at a walking pace where you think you could walk all day long. Nothing, nothing crazy hard. Um, just a very slow grad, almost like a saunter where you're just having, you know, shooting the breeze with someone walking along. So you've done that 90 seconds. You're going to go down to that slower walking phase and that's going to be around three to five minutes. So again, depending on your fitness level, if you're new to it, you'd want to go maybe for the five minutes. If you're a little, if you've been, you know, a little more active already, you can do the three minutes. Um, and then, you know, just keep going at that pace. And then at that five minutes, you're going to go again at that 90 second pace. So at this point, you know, it might be, again, it's hard. It's subjective for everyone. It might be more of a, a way more brisk walk or that super light jog. Like I said, something where you definitely feel like you're working. It might be that slight burning because it's a little more intense, but nothing that's over the top, you know, kind of excruciating full on sprint. So you've done that 90 seconds again, then you go back to that three to five minutes. The advantage here, though, is you have that longer recovery time. So ideally, you'll feel better um, as recovery goes. So this whole thing is going to take around 30 minutes as you repeat that process between the 90 seconds on and that three to five minutes off. And then as when you finish that final last 90 seconds, some people call it a, as far as this lit training, some people call it a, 
a chase or like a boost pace. That's the intensity part. So whenever you finish this final burst or whatever, you're going to spend eight to 10 minutes at that recovery, that slower walking pace. And that's going to serve as your cool down. And then, you know, you can do some lighter stretching and, and whatnot. So for exercise choice, like I said, this walking, jogging, brisk walk combo is one of the best because um, it's easy to monitor. It's outside. It's free. It gets you fresh air, the whole deal. With the exercises, it's going to be a little different than some of the high intensity interval training exercises. Like you wouldn't necessarily want to do this with burpees or like I said, with full sprints, but it would also work really well on some cardio machines like the bike again, where you can bump up the intensity. So say if it's on a one to 10 scale with that gauge where you can crank it up, um, you'd want to be going at maybe like um, a six for that higher, that 90 second higher intensity pace, and then dial it back to like a two for that three to five minute recovery phase would work really, I think pretty well on an elliptical machine again, where you just increase the intensity and maybe the pace you're going at a little bit, and then you can slow it right down. And, you know, you can even like go backwards, just kind of vary it up and get like a, a more recovery phase. It would work again well on a treadmill. It just, you know, it might take you a little while to kind of nail, narrow it down to the exact um, speeds you need to increase it to for that higher intensity phase and then drop it right back down. So it works better with some of these cardio things. And, and a lot of the research is, is based around the cardio um, choices. Like I said, you're not going to do this with um, squat presses per se because you'd be doing you know almost 10 minutes of a continuous exercise which would be too long so a bit more suited to the a cardiovascular aspect and it, again depending on your level of fitness this might be um just thinking of other examples like it might be swimming where you would do a comfortable stroke for that 90 seconds if you can count it and then either slow it down and just, you know, do some slow walking through the pool. Like, I don't know what you have access to, but that kind of thing. So I think you can think of different forms this would work well with. Like I said, that running, jogging, walking combo is one of the best, whether it's, you know, the treadmill or outside or anything like that. So I mentioned, you know, high intensity interval training has been studied to death. Like it's constantly looked at and monitored, but this low intensity interval training is, um, being observed more now too. And I'm looking at this, um, one study from the, where are we here? Um, American, uh, physiological society in the journal of applied physiology. And they're looking at this low volume, high intensity interval training. And they seeing, seeing, seeing it to reduce hyperglycemia and increase that muscle mitochondrial capacity. Remember I said the more of the fat going in like 50% more fat going into the, uh, mitochondria to be burned off. Um, and that was the advantage of the HIT training. This thing is happening with the low intensity training too. So they're looking at um, patients with type 2 diabetes and finding these results from the this low volume um, interval training. Again, some more um, research being done, looking at the walking, just the walking aspect, like changing the intensity of the walking from that slow recovery pace to a brisker um, intensity. It's so we're at the Ohio State University and they measured the benefits of walking at the, those varying speeds. And they specifically wanted to see and measure the calories burned or you know what the metabolic change is gonna be of just changing those speeds. And they determined ultimately, like this is where it sort of kicks off this looking at this low intensity interval training. They we're looking that we are really under underestimating the number of calories burned, even while just walking in daily life or, you know, while we play sports or whatnot. And in fact, that 8% of the energy used during daily walking may be due to energy we spend just starting and stopping. So whether you're tying your shoe or, you know, no, as you walk, just say if you're walking on your block or walking your dog, um, it's not always steady state. It's just this stopping and going process is potentially providing a lot of, Benefit. So if you're walking your dog and it stops to do its thing and whatever, then you get going again. Um, eight percent of the energy uses just from that. So the more you can vary your intensities as you go, that's what's providing 
um, potentially more of these benefits. So even just funny as well, they're just looking at the way you walk. If you're walking in a curve as opposed to a straight line, or if you're carrying a bag or a backpack, it can burn up to 20% more calories than walking at a consistent pace. It just seems like our bodies respond much better to this um, sort of segmented, I don't want to call it training, but activity. When you're doing things at different intervals, our body just responds um, best to that. And this um, relates with, uh, there's another Canadian study here, and they were, you know, supporting that idea that you can lose weight and get healthy with the low intensity interval training. Now, it doesn't mean you should ditch the HIT training because that's still effective. It's just showing that it's possible to still get some good results from doing this low intensity style. So, what they did is they split uh, the participants of the study into two groups, with one group performing um, the short high intensity workouts and the other exercising at low intensity for a longer interval of time. And both types of exercise yielded the same results when it came <clears throat> to calories burned and um, abdominal fat loss, which is really interesting. So looking at this a little further, so this is from Queen's University um, here in Ontario, which is uh, in Kingston, Ontario and they were they were looking at you know patients at risk for diabetes or heart disease and you know obesity issues and looking at this different style of training and um, obviously you know exercise has been shown to reduce obesity and and that glucose tolerance issue we talked about like how the insulin resistance and sensitivity um, and they in the actual study so there's 300 um, where they considered obese adults to determine those separate effects of the exercise amount and the intensity on how it helped burning um, stomach fat and impro improving those that glucose tolerance. So they were all you know randomly assigned. Like I said, they did the high intensity or the long lower intensity workouts five times a week, and they monitored and were instructed to eat the you know healthy diet through the same thing. So they didn't change their calorie intake. They just focused on you know cleaner, real whole foods, which obviously play a huge part in everything, but they wanted to keep things as, as the same as possible. So 24 weeks later, um, they, all of them experienced the similar reductions in their waist circumference and the high intensity group, um, experienced a little lower, um, you know, better re reduction in, and how their body, um, was, you know, potentially overly insulin resistant. It started to lower that. So that the high intensity interval training, will always be a little more effective, but it was still effective for the low um, intensity group. So what they, from their school of kinesiology here at Queens, the, the idea that the results show a really clear benefit to, you know, like I said, don't get rid of the high intensity interval training. It's super effective and helpful. Um, but for those who think, like I mentioned earlier, if you think they're maybe too difficult or you're new or you're um, older or whatever, this, um, the results can still be achieved simply by increasing that how you do your normal walking. Like I said, if it's that lighter jogging phase, as he said, if you move, if you start, start this low intensity interval training, you can um, see some of the same results that come from the high intensity interval training. Um, you know, walking at that brisker pace, the light jog or whatnot. And the interesting thing when they were talking and getting feedback from the people after the participants were surprised how easy it was for them to attain um, this higher level of training. You know, they're used to just walking all the time and it didn't take long for their body to adapt and be able to go more in intense and intense in that 90 second period. So another example he gave, which is effective. So say you're doing your work on a, a treadmill. He said, all you have to do is just maybe increase the incline on it while walking on a treadmill um, to go at that brisker pace. So, you know, you're starting off for five to eight minutes, walking comfortably, bump that, um, inner or that incline up and then do that for your 90 seconds and see how that feels. Drop it back down for the three to five minutes at the comfortable pace, lower it down. And then, like I said, play around with it. So there's lots of ways to do it. And there's more studies about this. I won't go into them more. I just wanted to show you that, um, what's being looked at and how effective it is seeing to be for, you know, reducing body fat and improving some of those, hormonal markers in the body. Um, so yeah, pretty promising and, um, you know, not ditching the hit training at all, but this is a great place to start. Or if you've, you're, you're new to fitness and you've been 
trying, you know, some different things and um, playing around with cardio machines. And th- this is something that you can add into it very easily to start getting better benefits. And it'll help maybe propel you into more intense exercises later and then maybe into more of like a strength training program or whatnot. So it has a good foundation in kind of setting your body up to get into this better response position by doing this intervals, you know, in in whatever form they are. So I'll cut it off there. Hopefully that's good. If you have any more questions about this whole deal, like I said, I've been looking at this for the last few weeks and there's like, it's, you know, relatively new, but there's some decent research and information out there that's not super um, publicized yet. I don't know if this is something that will grow, but I think for the people who are maybe wanting to start things off a little easier and they're looking for a little more uh, of a challenge, this low intensity interval training is perfect. So, but if you have more questions, just uh, email me at info at regainedwellness.com. If you're also interested, I do online coaching with people and I've been working with people right now doing this exact sort of thing and they're starting to um, respond well to it. I have a few clients doing um, just working basically around treadmills because it's nice because you can control pacings and stuff like that. And, you know, they're already losing some weight, um, getting a little fitter. And it's interesting because I've always worked with people like I work with a lot of younger athletes and stuff and it's always high intensity interval training base like super crazy hard um stuff like that but they're athletes they can handle it and the low intensity interval training is something relatively new to me too and it's um working good with some of the people I work with who um are you know maybe a, a little older or they've been off of fitness for a little while or you know joint problems that's always a big one so the intensity issue is um got to be addressed so you know you got to dial things back a bit but they're doing well in it so i mean if that's something you're interested in you can write there at info at regainwellness.com if you're interested in this um uh online coaching so it's a good way to easily be able to monitor what you're doing you can constantly be in contact um yeah it works pretty well so yeah that's it let's wrap it up there thanks for listening uh, like i said those show notes are regainwellness.com slash 113 and i have those other i'll link all these studies too if you're interested to see them a little more information on them and they're the way they break them down it's good they're not super early some parts of them are super scientific but the way they kind of summarize the whole thing in the synopsis makes them pretty easy reading so if you like that sort of thing you can check them out so regainwellness.com slash 113 okay i'm done thanks for listening See you later.